Greetings, everyone. Thanks so much for joining us for the uh, extension of the amazing celebration this morning um, at the Edwin W. Gordon Centennial Conference. Um, I have enjoyed all the conversation thus far, and you're in for a treat because we have a number of brilliant scholarly colleagues and scholars whose work have been influenced by Dr. Gordon. Um, our session toward the affirmative development of intellective competence and agency in every human being is an, a direct offshoot of the work of Dr. Gordon. Uh, it, it, it speaks to his work in thinking around supplementary education and affirmative education, how to translate not just education, but really focusing on educative experiences. And um, I am so excited to introduce uh, these amazing scholars who will join us. Um, we have Dr. Seema Lee Boykin, an assistant professor in cognitive linguistic and psychological sciences at Brown University, um, a brilliant scholar, who's worked so much on the intersections of the cognitive, linguistic, and psychological work around the experiences of Black children. Um, we also have uh, Professor Anna Marie Corse, who is the president of the University of Washington and has done such an amazing job in, in leading and guiding that institution around its four key areas of leading a student experience and global impact and public mission work and infusing the community with, with, with innovation. Um, also, my personal heroes, Dr. Freeman Herboski, um, his book, Holding Fast to Dreams, Empowering Youth from the Civil Rights Crusade to STEM Achievement is a must read for anyone who's interested in not just STEM education, but the education of, of, of black youth and finding ways to allow them to be fully actualized in the world. He is uh, president of the University of Maryland, Baltimore County. Um, we also have Robert J. Sternberg, who has been identified as one of the 50 most influential living psychologists um, but he's also right now a professor of human development in the College of Human Ecology at Cornell University. Um, uh, professor Ernst Washington, professor in the School of, uh, School of Education at the University of, Mass of Massachusetts Amherst. And um, my esteemed colleague, uh, Dr. Harvey Varen, who's a department chair and, a, and program director in the programs in anthropology. And, and I'm always uh, amazed about his work around culture and communication and education, how they intersect. And anytime I hear these brilliant scholars and think of their work, um, I, 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 I see the roots in, uh, in Dr. Gordon's scholarship. Um, and so I'm excited to unleash them all on you. I will now pass the baton off to um, who will give us a presentation on his work. Hello, hello. Uh, greetings, uh, happy and humbled to be here on this esteemed panel and back here at Teachers College, my master's degree alma mater. Uh, in celebration of Edmund Gordon, uh, not only my one of my mentors and heroes, but also uh, my father's mentor. So uh, happy to to be celebrating him uh, in this in this manner. So I, I'm going to be presenting on my work uh, regarding algorithmic literacy, uh, and we are off and flying. So there is a, a, an issue uh, when it comes to algorithmic fairness, uh, and I'm gonna lay out my objectives uh, to describe the origin and nature uh, of my collaboration with Sarah Brown, a computer scientist who I have a joint lab with, uh, talk about the problem space of algorithmic bias that we're uh, addressing together, show that there's many places that psychologists and educators can add value to this conversation. Uh, describe our approach uh, and briefly demonstrate one of the three algorithmic bias apps that we've developed that uh, help to assess people's preferences for algorithmic fairness. And I'll explain a bit more what that means uh, so it's not just words coming out of my mouth. And I will also invite uh, just people in general to consider contributing to this uh, to this problem space, uh, uh, solving this problem space. So I would start it. Uh, I did a postdoc here at Brown University where I'm now an assistant professor. Met Sarah Brown, who's a computer scientist. And she and I figured out quickly that we were interested in a lot of the same topics. Uh, we were just approaching them from different ways and really had a tough time uh, building synergy or really talking to each other because of the, the jargons of the disciplines were so far apart. But we are both affiliated with the Data Science Initiative. She postdoc there. I'm a, uh, I work there now um, as affiliate faculty. 
But while she was here, I joined an algorithmic bias reading group. We'd met several times, talked to ideas, uh, sent her psychology papers to help her to understand uh, measurement as, as uh, thought of by psychologists. She sent me papers to think about algorithmic bias. Uh, we worked through language barriers, but we decided to build a plane while flying anyway uh, in terms of, of combining our efforts to, to think about this uh, and started building a team that included psychology students as UX researchers, uh, coders, and uh, code testers to, um, to build something. Uh, so now uh, Sarah's at University of Rhode Island as an assistant professor, and uh, we continue this collaboration pretty, pretty frequently. We have a joint weekly lab meeting where we advance this work. But so what, right? Uh, what are we building? Uh, uh, and uh, <laughs> hold on, we'll, we'll get there. I, I will reveal that in, in time. So the problem space, the algorithms, they're biased. Uh, there's gender recognition systems that are failing systematically on darker skin faces and miscategorizing people. Uh, healthcare algorithms are uh, misdiagnosing people and exacerbating uh, health disparities. There are algorithms being implemented by counties uh, that we'll, we'll talk a bit uh, more, you know, uh, that are allocating bail at, at different rates, uh, uh, giving people different higher risks of recidivism scores uh, that are biased across racial groups. And at scale, this, uh, this really just becomes a massive problem. And we are hoping to, to contribute to mitigating this. And also, people are mostly unaware that this is going on, especially um, where the technology uh, workforce uh, is is you know uh, relatively homogenous and is ex historically excluded people of color, uh, which also excludes us from the conversations. Uh, there are needs of issue needs and issues in marginalized communities that are being overlooked uh, because people aren't in the room to say, "Hey, we need to do this," and or because people aren't listening to people when they say that that these algorithms need to be. Uh, modified. Uh, and many of the people who are affected either aren't necessarily knowing what's happening or aren't able to contribute to, you know, what uh, a potential solution could be. And so part of what we're hoping to do with this work is to develop a, a um, curriculum and a way to measure what people's opinions about this are and, and about how to mitigate this uh, which also includes teaching people about algorithmic bias to then assess their uh, their perspectives about what should be done. So that's ultimately where this is where where we're headed with this. So what is algorithmic bias? Uh, one set of definitions of it includes where uh, uh, places where computer scientists and machine learning engineers have derived statistical definitions of algorithmic fairness that look pretty similar to debates that have had been happening in the uh, standardized testing uh, debates through the years uh, and so on and so forth. But violating one of these statistical definitions results in bias. But the issue there is that there's multiple statistical definitions. Violating one of them, uh, I mean, satisfying one of them means violating the other. So you kind of end up with uh, this mutual exclusivity that is uh, uh, quite frustrating. And then it's a question of, well, which of these uh, uh, should be um, used, given that the algorithms will inherently be biased, right? So we're going to go through a brief tutorial on algorithms that mirrors uh, some of the concepts that we're uh, discussing in the tutorial that we give to participants uh, in this work. <clears throat> so <clears throat> how do decision algorithms work? We uh, are using uh, in this work a spam filter example, given that many people are, are familiar with spam uh, or fam familiar with emails and that some of them get filtered in the spam. So a spam filter will get uh, some level of training data, some emails that should be marked as spam and some that shouldn't. You get, you know, for example, you get columns of emails from previous years to then uh, find the pattern uh, between the emails that, that marks the, the ones that should be spam as spam and the ones that should be delivered as deliverable. And 
it might say, oh, there's suspicious links or overuse of capitals or things that are sent in bulk or, or suspicious uh, words or phrases that help to teach the uh, algorithm uh, how things should be categorized. Then this outfits a decision algorithm and the decision algorithm now can go forward and make uh, decisions. So then you could take a new test data set to then see how your algorithm performs on new data where you already know the outcomes just to see how, how well it does. And, and essentially you're auditing it. So let's say then you have the emails from 2020 um, and then this will spit out a set of decisions that you can then uh, run test statistics on, on how well it did the classifications right? How well did it do? And from this standpoint, you can use relatively basic statistics to make sense out of it, uh, whether the decision's accurate, uh, or how many false positives uh, were there, or mis, you know, miscategorized you know, emails that were called spam that should not have been. And at this point in time, you can also disaggregate uh, the emails that decisions have been made about to see whether or not it is performing fairly across a set of groups. So let's say you wanted to look at emails that came uh, originate from Nigeria versus emails that originated from the Ukraine and test whether or not the performance is equitable uh, across emails that came from both of these origins, right? And then, then there's the question of, well, which definition of fairness is more fair, right? Where accuracy is percent correct, uh, derived from the, you know, correctly delivered plus correctly not sent to spam divided by all email versus false positive rate, which is mistakenly marked as spam divided by all denied as spam. Certainly they're confounded, but they're also, um, you know, you can equalize an algorithm for one or for the other. And many people have um, debates about which of these definitions is more fair, uh, but a set of debates that many people are excluded from because not everybody is a machine learning uh, engineer trying to um, you know, get, this, get this resolved, right? So this same kind of process also matters for other types of algorithms, right? Because for, for things like bail decision algorithms, um, you know, some people just aren't necessarily thinking about this or not quite sure what to do next given the information. Some people are saying that we should abolish algorithms uh, or try to figure out which statistical definition is most, most fair because, right, it gets way realer than, than just emails, right? So in the same sense, um, the Broward County, Florida has implemented an algorithm that has become a, a subject of much debate, the compass algorithm, where it works pretty much in the same way. And you could take bail decisions and then disaggregate the data to figure out whether or not this is operating equally for black and white defendants um, in, in the justice system. And the compass says, hey, you know, are, are we designed this thing to be fair? ProPublica says, wait a minute, no, you have differential false positive rates. Compass says we put the accuracy rates equal and uh, thus, you know, uh, a debate has ensued. So which metric is most preferred? Accuracy, false positive rates equalized, some other statistical definition that computer scientists have derived, or uh, a preference that is not yet known, uh, an unknown balance of competing definitions that could potentially be derived from human subjects research. And that's uh, where we are coming in with this particular work. And a lot of the work that has been done to this point looks like computer scientists doing social science research, making mistakes that would frustrate many um, social scientists Hence, you know, the uh, opportunities for synergy, not just by the lab that Sarah and I are running together, but by many. Uh, one such study uh, done by Harrison et al. Uh, starts with an AI tutorial framed in terms of decisions in a basketball tournament where many of my female research assistants' uh, eyes glossed over while reading this paper. Um, 
they, they definitely found that the email spam filter version to be much uh, more accessible. But they did a round robin of comparative models where some groups uh, had equal accuracy, some groups had false positive rate, they switched groups, they also use equalized odds. Uh, and in a round robin of 12 conditions across 500 participants, a severely underpowered study that just was frustrating to read as a psychologist. And then there's the alt the other idea of like under what conditions this uh, uh, is gonna matter, uh, whether or not there's group processes at play or framing effects at play, uh, as well as severity of outcomes, right? Because there's cancer diagnosis outcomes as well as auto loan outcomes and so on and so forth. And then there's the question of, do people understand this uh, uh, to begin with? And in one study, uh, a measurement of understanding uh, after reading a tutorial was created, and then they had a questionnaire that ended up with a 0.38 alpha reliability. Uh, I, I, surely that would frustrate anybody in psych and measurement because below 0.7, things get a little dicey. Um, they started deleting items and got it up to a 0.64, which is also not very good, uh, you know, psychometric fidelity. <laughs> you know, many people say don't do this, uh, including Raykov. So, uh, so then, you know, how do we uh, learn more about the preferences? And this gets us to exactly uh, what we're building with our lab, or what we've built, actually. So we built a tutorial that walks people through the email uh, issue, and then walks them into another uh, uh, through the, the issue of bail granting algorithms. Now this platform is fully modifiable, so if we wanted to talk about home loans or auto loans or cancer diagnosis, all of these parameters can be changed. We can also change it to false positive rate versus equalized odds or something like that. But this is an interface where uh, an individual can toggle between the, the two uh, fairness definitions, and you get a dynamic feedback into how this is going to affect uh, the various groups. So they walk through a, a tutorial that's couched in, in this framework. Um, here, not going to read all of this, but we have a fictional city, Metro City, that uh, we describe such an algorithm will be implemented, and then people get to ask, uh, get to answer questions about this, right? And Right, so then we get you know feedback on how well they understand the interface uh, with with questions uh, in the tutorial, as well as ultimately then asking them what do they think is fair, and they will get to give us a sense of where they think. Uh, fairness falls between false positive rate, uh, equal accuracy, uh, and this will allow us to get feedback from people from many different demographics uh, and many different contexts, and this is our approach to this conversation. As well, this tool will soon be available to um, for, for use to many researchers. It'll be open source, and um, we're very excited about this work. So thank you. Uh, from the Artificial Intelligence Fairness Joint Lab. This is uh, Sarah at the top and all my many research assistants uh, and people who I enjoy pouring into and mentoring uh, in, in the ways that Professor poured into and, and mentored my father and I. Thank you so much. Um. You know, I, I've told you this, you know, off camera before, but every time I hear you speak and I hear about your work, I'm in awe of, of your brilliance and genius, dear brother. So uh, th thank you for that presentation. And, you know, I also want to say, like, you know, the ways that you highlight algorithmic bias, um, you know, really speaks to Dr. Gordon's work and the way that you, you can you know, you identify the limitations of phenomena that are framed as objective and how they reinforce bias. And, and, you, and you really brilliantly you know, describe for us how deep subjectivity is actually the ultimate objectivity. Um, and your connections to criminal justice and lived experience is just amazing. Um, so thank you again. Um, I have the deep honor to now introduce our next uh, speaker or presenter, um, uh, Dr. Anna Marie Cosse, um, again, uh, president of the University of Washington, and she will take us through a, a conversation about her work and, 
and draw some connections to uh, Dr. Gordon's amazing work that guides us all. Thank you so much. Um, it's not at all an exaggeration for me to say that it's truly a privilege of a lifetime for me to be here today because Edmund W. Gordon was my dissertation advisor and my academic mentor and so much more. He was actually a lifeline for me and he's the main reason why I'm here today doing work that I love and that I believe will make a difference. But when I first sought Ed out as an advisor, that was unimaginable. I was personally and academically adrift. I just started my third year in the Child Clinical Community PhD program at Yale, but I wasn't sure what I was doing there anymore. As a scholar, I was recovering from a toxic laboratory environment. And on a more personal level, I was struggling to recover from the death of my brother, who had recently been murdered by the KKK as part of the Greensboro massacre. As has become all too common these days, it was captured on film and I saw him get shot and die on TV, images that will forever be seared on my soul. I was broken, struggling for direction and to maintain hope in the world. Ed must have thought twice before agreeing to take me on. My vulnerability and distress were obvious, my wounds fresh, the scar tissue hadn't even begun to form. But he welcomed me with open mind and heart into a community full of enthusiastic learners, most of whom were also students of color, where my interest in learning about BIPOC youth wasn't derisively dismissed as me search, but it was viewed as an essential area for study and research. He invited me into his home where we would have coffee and conversations that went well beyond how far along I'd gotten on my literature. He shared with me some of his own struggles and triumphs growing up in segregated America, marching with Martin Luther King and John Lewis. He encouraged me to pursue a dissertation that would focus on black youth without comparing them to a white control group, an idea that was virtually unheard of at that time in the quantitative social sciences, and to focus on their competencies, not deficiencies, which was almost as novel. We talked about what made it possible for them to be defiers of negative prediction, a concept which foreshadowed that of resilience, but better captures the fact that it's not just an individual characteristic. The ability to defy is a product of agency plus support and resources. I would arrive at our meetings with a list of methodically categorized questions for him, only to find him asking me questions after question, drawing me out, pushing me to think more deeply. He believed in me more than I believed in myself. And slowly, as my confidence returned, so did my joy in learning and my sense of purpose in life. I could make a difference as an educator, researcher, and scholar, and this life was my calling. I talk about this here, not only to pay tribute to Ed, although there's nothing wrong with that, but because what I experienced with him was all those things that we'll be talking about in the next two days as we describe what teaching and learning environments are all about and should be. It's an illustration of how teaching and learning is about more than mastering subject matter. He did give me papers and books to read, introducing me to new vocabulary and concepts, including affirmative development, something none of my other instructors talked about in that manner. But at its core, Ed's tutelage was all about guiding me towards developing my own deep understanding of the questions that I was tackling and of developing my own sense of agency. Not just a belief in myself and my abilities, but an understanding that I could and must use these to make a difference in the world, to have an impact. Throughout my time as president of the University of Washington, I'm often asked about 
my strategic plan. And I simply say to be the top public university in terms of impact. And that goal, that desire was forged in my tutelage with Ed. And our goal as educators, scholars, leaders, and activists should be about creating such communities at scale. I'll focus on doing this with early childhood learning because that's where Professor Ed's professional journey first began, something we at times forget about. It began helping to design and leading the evaluation of the Head Start program, the longest lasting legacy of the war against poverty and quite arguably the most widely acclaimed and successful government sponsored educational program ever. It has survived more than 55 years and has set the bar for every other early childhood intervention program out there. For anybody else, this would have been the achievement of a lifetime. Yet Ed has expressed disappointment in its shortcomings, even using the word failure, because while it did provide educational enhancement activities to the child and the family, it never thought it never sought to truly empower them. As Ed has reminded us time and time again, the problem of the poor is not one of stunted growth or lack of strengths, but about lack of resources and how that affects one's sense of agency. Now, unlike most educational programs, to be fair, Head Start did acknowledge the importance of parental involvement. Parents were viewed as partners and they were encouraged to participate and to volunteer at centers. That may seem like no big deal today, but parental involvement was viewed as radical at the time. Some experts even warned that it could lead to Head Start centers recreating the impoverished home and community environments that they were trying to remediate. But in the face of such views, Ed was adamant in his, I'll quote, conviction that Head Start should and would become part of an increasingly strong movement among the poor of our country to take control of the course of their lives, including the education of their children, end quote. That conviction, that conviction was at least partly heated and parents did have an advisory role in saying, and how Head Start centers were run. And Ed was right, it did make a difference. By now, decades of research have demonstrated that greater parental involvement in early childhood programs is associated with positive gains in cognitive language and socio-emotional development. And now we have a new wave of programs that take this involvement to a whole new level by focusing more efforts on strengthening the resources and capabilities of parents and caretakers, rather than on simply providing them with volunteer opportunities and parent education, which was the predominant Head Start model at the time. And Ed, I can say now that we're finally getting closer to what you had the foresight to suggest, the foresight to suggest more than 50 years ago. Programs that build not only literacy and numeracy, but true intellective competence. Two that I particularly like are Mind in the Making, MITM, and its partner program, Vroom, V-R-O-O-M, for families of children zero to eight. They emphasize building and strengthening real world life skills, such as focus and self-control, perspective taking, critical thinking, and self-directed engaged learning, all core to the notion of human agency and the disposition to use it. This skill set is especially critical for children growing up in families and communities characterized by poverty, where they're still way too often seen as passive recipients of interventions developed by others who believe they know best. MITM and Vroom put the family squarely in the driver's seat, providing them not only with access to the brake accelerator and wheel, 
but to the abilities required to construct a roadmap to take them to destinations that they choose. In MTIM, parents are in effect taken on field trips into the labs of over 100 top developmental researchers to see science in action, streaming real experiments in developmental research that were actually developed for the college classroom. They're also provided with access to a library of all, about 100 children's books, and they're given free downloadable learning tips to promote skills very much in sync with Professor Gordon's notion of intellective competencies and human agencies. Online modules developed by UW faculty feature a set of parents from diverse backgrounds discussing and applying the lab-based research to their own lives. And these are made freely available to every Head Start and early childhood program in the nation, making the science of early learning as accessible as your phone. Now, taking a slightly different approach, Room draws from the best developmental and neuroscience research to create over a thousand different tips that are on cards that encourage and allow parents or caretakers to form a moment in time, a moment in just your day-to-day -day activity and turn it into a learning moment. For example, a tip for a three to four year old is called red light, green light. Okay, so what does it do? It suggests playing a game where at first you say green light and your child runs. Then you say red light and they stop. But after they've done that for a while, you switch it up. And when they run, they run when you say red light and stop when you say green light. Then there's a card called brainy background that explains that this activity both strengthens their child's working memory, they need to keep the rule in their head, and their self-control, both when they stop and go and when they switch roles because they have to inhibit their natural tendencies from the first time around. Vroom doesn't require buying costly games or toys, and it can be built into the regular course of a day or a week. Parents can pick the tips that suit, that suit their own skill and comfort level and are provided with a scientific rationale behind the activity written concisely at a third to fifth grade vocabulary level. The focus isn't on fixing children or adults for that matter. They support adults to be positive change agents in their children's lives. They empower and uplift. And I especially love that the video that introduces parents to Vroom takes them into homes like theirs, where they receive a mirror in a surprise package with words inscribed on it saying, you already have what it takes. Now there's a clear message. One more program I'll mention is geared explicitly towards fathers. It's called Filming Interactions to Nurture Development or FIND. In this case, find, in this case FIND F because it's for fathers. Fathers are filmed while engaging in routine activities such as playing or eating with their children. And kind of like the broom mirror telling parents that they have what it takes, these films are then analyzed and edited to select and highlight strengths in those father-child interactions. And these strength-based clips that are of the father himself are then reviewed with fathers to reinforce and bolster responsive father-child interaction. Now, all of these programs that I've mentioned, MITM, Vroom, Find F, have been rigorously evaluated or are being rigorously evaluated. And the early findings are quite positive. For example, initial results from Find F suggest that fathers significantly increased their serve and return conversational terms and increased the amount of language and emotional support that they were providing their children. And it's especially effective for fathers who have faced adversity themselves growing up. MITM, 
Vroom and Find F are just a few examples of programs that allow low-income parents to, in Professor Gordon's own words, take control of their child's education. They treat parents and caretakers as true partners with developmental researchers and service providers. And they also provide a clear rationale for the approach and an understanding of the science behind them. There's no talking down. These are about uplifting and assume intelligence, um, which in fact, the caretakers no question have. They're mindful also of the stressful and difficult environments that low-income parents operate in, not expecting from them this long commitment of time and resources that would be impossible to obtain and even more impossible to maintain. And now at the University of Washington, building upon a convening of early learning researchers, program providers, and community leaders to identify challenges, design solutions, and imagine the best environment that would result in success for children, families, and communities, we've envisioned the creation of an early learning resource center and idea generator in a diverse South Seattle community. Key goals of this center are to provide expanded access to family support services, including early childhood education programs, childcare, before and after school programs, and parent and caretaker resources. University of Washington early childhood faculty work with community-based researchers and in close partnerships with parents and community leaders to develop, test, and implement state-of-the-art approaches to enhance the affirmative development of children and families. The center will also provide affordable, relevant, and innovative professional development and degree completion programs to early childhood learning professionals, including childcare providers, teachers, infant mental health specialists, and early learning policymakers, as well as others. The partnerships forged between childcare and higher education at the center will help launch careers in education, ensuring that from the very start, Seattle's children will have teachers that look like them, understand their communities, and speak their language. The plans for the center are ambitious, both in serving our community, but also having national reach, able to incubate and disseminate culturally sustaining evidence-based practices to early childhood programs in the state and every Head Start and Early Head Start program in the country. And because of its planned location, adjacent to affordable housing and to a light rail station, we envision a true living learning community built around children and families, weaving in playful learning landscapes that spark interactions between children and adults while they walk through green spaces or ride the elevator to their building or wait for the train. We're still in the fundraising and development stage, but I'm very optimistic that when we come back here to celebrate Professor Gordon's 105th birthday, it will not only be built, but I can better describe the program it houses and the evaluation results. And when we celebrate his 110th, I can describe its dissemination across the state and how findings are being used to inform work across the country. Professor Gordon, your vision was the right one, and it not only lives, we will make it happen. Thank you. Um, Professor Kalsi, thank you so much for that amazing talk. I, I've not only enjoyed uh, the substance of the work, but also in the arc of the description, and there's much to learn from you. Um, I was particularly struck uh, by your descriptions of Professor Gordon's impact in your life personally. And it reminds you that the work of a scholar is not to you know, always publish the most brilliant work, but it's to make an impact, to question, to challenge, to grow together with their students. Um, and I can't wait to find out what happens next 
um, you know, MITM, Room Find F, all programs that that I could again see the roots of Dr. Gordon sort of theorizing in the 60s and 70s. I could see that in this work. And uh, truly, the University of Washington um, and the young people in Seattle are, are, are lucky and blessed to have you. Um, right now, I have the, the honor and gift to, to introduce, uh, you know, guy I call, I call one of my OGs, uh, Dr. Freeman Haboski, president of the University of Maryland, Baltimore County. Um, and he will talk about his work and, and his connections to Dr. Gordon. Thank you, Chris, very much. And, and I want to commend Anamari on, on, her, on her paper, on the work that she's doing at the University of Washington. Anamari, I was so excited because I'm to talk about something involving science, but I have to tell you that Ed Gordon influenced me in many ways. One has to do with helping me as a, a leader in math and, and math education to think about the role of a president with early childhood. And we actually have a, an, a Sherman Center for Early Learning, UMBC Center for Early Learning, uh, with major, major funding from the Sherman family. And it's for particularly for er learning in, in urban communities. And that's, and we have focused on birth to age eight and families are very involved. So I appreciate what you said about that, but I am to talk today about my relationship with Ed Gordon. He is one of my heroes and mentors and has been that for decades and decades. And he knows that the work that I have been engaged in for years has had to do with high achieving minority students, heavily focused on African-Americans. And secondly, with a special focus on African-American males. We began with that group at a time when it was not popular back in the 80s to talk about the young black male. Um, we have young black women in that program, other people of color, uh, particularly Latinx students now in the Meyerhoff Scholars Program. But I want to give you some context. Uh, everything I say today is based on a, a question that I began asking as a child. And Ed Gordon was one of those people who helped me to understand the importance of talking about childhood experiences. As he talked about his growing up in North Carolina and having a mother who was a teacher and dad who was a country doctor. I was the child of, of, of educators, of teachers. And interestingly enough, I was fortunate to go to jail with Dr. King. I was in the Children's March in uh, 1963. I was 12 years old. Um, and that experience taught me a lot about building community as the children worked, as we worked to find the strength to go up against fire hoses and police. Uh, and to be in that jail being treated like slaves or animals. Uh, and I'll never forget Dr. King coming and saying to us, what you children, he was outside and all the children are there, little kids are crying and the parents are outside trying to be strong. And he said, what you do for us this day will have an impact on children yet unborn. And we were empowered by that experience. And, and so when I think about the work of Ed Gordon, and the notion of building communities, of creating communities, and the importance of thinking about what happens to us in our childhood experiences and how those experiences shape who we become, and about the, the need to teach young people to have a sense of agency. Uh, I think about the work that we have been doing at UMBC and that we've been publishing on for some time. And so I wanna talk in a conversational manner about some of that work over the past 35 years, uh, having been talking with Ed Gordon, about high achievement for years and years. Does It wouldn't surprise anyone to know that Ed Gordon uh, had as one of his mentors, Du Bois. And when I began talking about wanting to understand what was happening with young black males, high achieving black males, and what was happening to them in science. And I got a lot of a criticism saying, well, they're gonna be okay, all right. Ed Gordon was one of the people in the early years who said to me, no, we need to understand more about high achievement among minority students and how we get more students to get into that category. And so, I had the privilege just a few years ago of chairing a committee because of the work we've been doing on Meyerhoff since the 80s uh, the, uh, for the National Academies of Sciences on underrepresentation in science and engineering. And it was not surprising to us. And this was a committee of faculty from Harvard and MIT to Howard University to University of some of the University of Texas campuses to Miami-Dade Community College. And, and I'll never forget to Florida a and we were not surprised that only 20% of blacks and Latinx students who began with a major in science and engineering were graduating 
um, with degrees in those areas, with bachelors in those areas. But we were stunned to see that only 31, 32 percent of whites and only 41 percent of Asians were succeeding. And so one of the major findings of our study 10 years ago was that we need to look at the performance of students across backgrounds, racial, ethnic backgrounds, income backgrounds, to see who is succeeding in science. And so what we had learned was that two thirds of Americans who begin with an interest in STEM will leave it within the first year or two, that there were large numbers of people of color beginning in those majors, but not completing degrees in those, those, those majors. And we looked at everything from the from K through 12 and pre-K through 12, through the college experience, through the graduate experience. And what was interesting was, while there's much to be done in many of those, those sectors from producing more teachers to going beyond that, to looking at the early childhood areas, one of the most critical areas was the undergraduate experience that we even when we were able to see students who'd come in with reasonable backgrounds in math and science most of them didn't succeed and what was stunning to us was that we found that often the more academically and socially prestigious the university the greater the probability that that student would leave science within the first year or two and that's why we continue to call these courses weed out courses we at UMBC had begun looking at these issues 20 years before that, back in the 80s. Uh, and interestingly enough, what you will see is that um, most important, African-American students were not succeeding in any type of institution, in any numbers, except in HBCUs. Uh, and there you would see the, 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 the suspects that we know about from Howard and Morehouse and Spelman and Hampton and Xavier and some others who would be the leading producers. However, those numbers were small also. And so the question my colleagues and I began asking in the late 80s was, can we find one predominantly white university that can say it's producing even five or six or seven blacks who go on and complete PhDs in STEM areas? And we could not find one. Um, UMBC is uh, has always been historically diverse, we say, but it was predominantly white at that time. It's about half of color now, with the largest minority group being Asian, but with about 20 percent blacks and seven or eight percent Latinos. Uh, and so we we took that on as a test. Can we become the first predominantly white institution at that time and now still non HBCU who was would be producing large numbers of African-Americans who go on, who get bachelor's degrees from us and go on and complete PhD somewhere. The first year we started with black males because they have been at the bottom of the ladder when thinking about academic performance. Uh, when we look at males of color, the challenges they face in the schools. And we talk a lot about those things. Uh, but that second year we brought in women. And I should say that the donor wanted to see what we could do with black males. And here's what we, we found that you'll find interesting that we could bring in students of color. African-Americans at first are now Latinx. The, the program is still heavily black, but we also brought in with years for legal reasons, um, students, white students and Asians who had an interest in understanding the challenges that underrepresented and underserved groups faced. And so the program is still about 60% of black, um, another five or 6% Latinx, and then that other one third of the students are white and Asian. But here is the most significant point that we have now become, after 30 years, the leading university in the country in producing blacks who go on to get PhDs in science and engineering. And in particular, in the life sciences and in math and computer science, we are number one. Um, uh, and so one of the lessons that we learned, first of all, as we were going through the evolution of this program, was to look at what lessons we were learning that could be used by other institutions. So we're not simply talking about a local, a local program. And so we were able to develop a theory. It's called the Social Transformation Theory of Change. Uh, and it is uh, written in a book entitled Toward Positive Youth Development. And that came out about two decades ago. Uh, and, and what the, the book showed was very similar to what Dr. Gordon has been saying all along. It's the idea of developing empowering settings, of looking at um, building community among those students and looking at the role they can play in, in having a sense of empowerment, of knowing they can control their destiny in that environment. But it's also about institutional change process and the role of senior leaders 
the role of faculty. If you look at my TED talk, it has four major elements. People either like it or they really don't like it. It's on four pillars of college success in STEM. Uh, and the first is high expectations. And then again, as Dr. Gordon would say, building community. And then it takes researchers to produce researchers. And then we need rigorous evaluation, quantitative and qualitative. And the high expectation is the one I want to mention though. It's not just high expectations of the students, helping them to understand what they need to do, giving them that, that sense of agency and a sense of self. And we, we have a variety of ways of doing that, but it's also high expectations of the university. We tend to focus on what the students have to do without looking at how we might change the way we do things, ways we might pull students into the mainstream and give them the support to know this place is for them also. And so if you look at that TED talk, if you look at the 60 Minutes piece on the Meyerhoff program, you'll get a sense of how we build community. You might be interested to know that in the Summer Bridge program where we are building that sense of agency and teaching them how they can take control we are also teaching them about working as a community together because in high schools, we tend not to teach students how to work collaboratively. In fact, when we work together in high schools, we often say the student is cheating. Um, you'll find most interesting that we take the phones away from the students during the week, uh, which caused a lot of hate mail from off campus. But the, the people who decided we should take the phones away were actually the students who were graduating from one summer program who said, if you want students to come together, and to really focus on each other's strengths and challenges. During the week, take the phones away. And so look at that and you'll get an example of that. But here are the several points I would make. Number one, that we've done a lot of publishing that I want to refer you to. There's no doubt in my mind that I was influenced by Ed Gordon when looking at the first two books that my colleagues and I, Ken Madden and Jeff Reif wrote, People Out of the Social Sciences. And those were Beating the Odds and Overcoming the Odds from literally from the late 90s. Uh, and each book, focuses on first on raising high achieving black males, the other book, raising high achieving black females. And, and the books are written listening to the voices of parents and of other people that the students told us were important in their lives, in their communities, in their schools. And we learned many lessons that we've used over the years. Um, and, and then the book that I wrote on, that was somewhat biographical, again, on the experience of childhood in the civil rights movement and how that shaped my thinking about producing science and engineering students. And so the, the, le the lessons finally that I want you to think about, number one, how do we go about identifying universities that are doing the best job in the country? We still have several other black HBCUs who are doing a fine job. Uh, I mentioned that we're number one in producing the students uh, who are going to get PhDs in STEM. Uh, North Carolina a t is number two. Howard is number three. Uh, and what you'll find interesting is that that list, of course, also includes several other HBCUs, um, uh, including Jackson State and Morgan State. There are more public HBCUs moving into that top 10 now. Uh, Spelman, of course, is number four, doing a fine job. And in the top group, you'll find the other suspects, Miami, Mata, Hampton, Morehouse, and others. But, but it is significant that the University of Florida is in that list and showing that we're beginning to have others that are not HBCUs. And similarly, for the Latino population, looking at that list, you'll see two of the University of Puerto Rico campuses, you'll see University of Florida again, Florida Atlantic University, but Texas El Paso is number one beyond the two Puerto Rican institutions. And then some of the UCAL campuses and University of Texas. Why am I bringing this up? Because I'm saying to make a difference in moving the needle, you say, well, why do you need to move the needle? Haven't we moved the needle? Well, in 2010, 2011, 2.1% of the PhDs awarded to the country were uh, awarded to Blacks, 2.1%. The most recent data, and we're about to publish this from NSF, the number, the, that percentage has gone from 2.1% to 2.3%. We're still in the 2% range. And the, the Hispanic percentages have not gone up substantially either. We're still talking about under 5%. What am I saying? How do we move the needle? We have several recommendations and we'll be, we publish these in Issues in Science and Technology before we are adding to it in the next publication in Issues in Science and Technology. It would be identifying the best practices, but also the, the institutions that have done the best job. It would be doubling those numbers. Why doubling? Well, if you double the, the percent that those in that top 30 of, H, of students, of institutions, HBCUs and others for blacks, you would actually increase the number of PhDs 
in the country by about 25%. And if you did the same thing for the Latino population, for the top 30, you would increase it by 45%. Those would be substantial increases in the number of PhDs. Now, success is not just about PhDs, but if we can produce more at the PhD level, we can have more in the professoriate and others can look to those people. The other major recommendation is that we need much greater coordination between the national agencies, particularly among them all, but particularly between NIH and NSF, as we think about uh, the notion of focusing, laser focus on the best to make them even better. And the other point that you will appreciate is this, that we are convinced that replication is possible. If you look at our science article, the UMBC science article written with colleagues at Chapel Hill and Penn State, you will see that we have been very successful in working with them with funding from Howard Hughes. And now we are working with Chan Zuckerberg on a similar replication at Berkeley and San Diego. And so Dr. Gordon, you have influenced my life my, my life, my research, and my work. And you've taught me that I could be a college president and still be a scholar, excited about the possibilities of moving the needle. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Hoboski, thank you so, so much. Uh, that was just a, a, a wonderful conversation and, and the connections you made to Dr. Gordon's work are just uh, absolutely astounding. And, you know, I, again, you know, whenever I think about your work, I, I just think about the practicality of it. Uh, the way that it addressed both at the theoretical and the scholarly, but also in the practical. And, and how, you know, what other exemplar do we have to talk about uh, the notion of agency being distributed um, to not just the power to act for young folks to be better, but also for institutions to enact a form of agency to create opportunities for the most marginalized young people to become actualized and, and live out their potential. Just absolutely brilliant work. Uh, thanks again. And we'll see you and, and the rest of our colleagues in the Q&A. So folks, don't forget, you get a chance to ask all these brilliant scholars questions about their work in more detail. Um, I now have the, the honor to introduce uh, Dr. Robert Sternberg to have a conversation about, about his work um, uh, and its connection to Dr. Gordon's legacy, but also in more detail about you know, the work that he's doing right now. I'm really, really looking forward to this one as well. Thank you so much. Can you hear me? Can. I was gonna start off this talk saying what an incredible honor it is to be on a panel with such a such eminent people and a panel in honor of Ed Gordon. And then I thought about something that happened this morning. I taught a really large course at Cornell. And this morning I started getting requests from students for extra credit. And I thought, I'm going to turn this around because I was remembering that when Ed and I were colleagues at Yale, we had all these great conversations about the need to change notions about intelligence and intelligence testing and racial differences in intelligence. And he gave me all these ideas. And I'm sure I gave him at least one idea. And I even contributed a chapter to an edited book he did, which I'm sure has been cited at least one time. So I thought in the spirit of extra credit, I would start off by demanding at least one zillionth of 1% of the credit for Ed's incredible career. And then I remembered that I taught Anna Marie Kausi in a course, or maybe two at Yale. And so I could probably ask for a zillionth of 1% of the credit for her career. And I really never had any interaction with Freeman Horabowski, but I've been so impressed by his work that I might as well throw in a trillionth or a zillionth of 1%. So I'm just so honored to be here. Moving on to my talk, the title is Throw the Confetti, How the Field of Intelligence Perpetuates Ability Myths Over the Generations. And I'm sure you'll hear a lot of Ed Gordon in this talk. So let's have the next slide. So the thesis of the talk is that the field of intelligence as it now exists throws confetti on those who are already advantaged by the structure of society and then perpetuates the myth that they and their offspring are the deserving ones. Nothing has changed since the early 20th century when intelligence tests were used to advantage the already benefited and to further disadvantage the already disadvantaged. Was that way then? It's that way today. Next slide. Next slide. So why does the field of intelligence exist? The cover story is that it's to learn about the nature of intelligence and how to measure and modify it. 
But what I'm going to argue today is that the field of intelligence research as it exists today is largely to perpetuate three Ps, the power, privileges, and prestige of those whom society already privileges, including indeed, especially the researchers who study intelligence, it keeps the existing power structure intact. Next slide, please. The problem is that the field of intelligence historically and to the present day has been based on the study of individual differences, which is in turn based on correlation coefficients and the statistical factors that result from them. Next slide. But what do correlation coefficients show? They show the relations between items given the current context of measurement. In other words, they're not given by nature. They're often inventions of the contexts we create in which tests are given. Next slide. The basic presumption has been that IQ tests and proxies predict life success. Charles Spearman's discovery in 1904 was that there's a positive manifold whereby all measures of cognitive abilities correlate positively with each other. And in 2021, the vast majority of researchers and practitioners in the field still believe that this is some kind of basic law of nature, so that if you don't do well in something, you probably won't do well in other things. Next slide. But is there any counter evidence? Are we basing a whole field on essentially a myth? So let me tell you about one study we did in rural Kenya. In rural Kenya, we found a negative correlation between children's scores on IQ tests and their proxies, proxies being SAT, ACT, GRE, all the alphabet soup tests, and tests of adaptive intelligence in the natural context in which the children live. So this goes counter to the notion that there must be some kind of natural positive manifold. Next slide. Is there any counter evidence? Well, in our multiple studies of practical intelligence, that is your intelligence every day, like as a college professor or as a business person or as a salesperson or in interactions with people, we repeatedly found trivial correlations between IQ tests and their proxies and tests of practical intelligence. Next slide, please. In a series of studies of STEM thinking, science, technology, engineering, and math, involving real scientific thinking, not the stuff on SATs and ACTs and GREs, but real scientific thinking, like generating alternative hypotheses, generating experiments, and evaluating conclusions from research. In other words, what scientists, engineers, technologists really do we found trivial and even negative correlations between IQ tests and their proxies and the measures of STEM thinking. So in three different kinds of research, the positive manifold didn't hold up. Why? Next slide. Why then do psychometric studies, of which there are thousands, people spend their whole friggin' career showing IQ tests correlate with this, and they correlate with this, and they correlate with this, and they correlate with that. A whole career spent, here's yet another thing. I suggested to an editor, I just write a paper saying, tests of cognitive ability correlate with performances and cognitive ability, but he didn't think it was funny. But essentially one sentence, and we could be rid of thousands of papers. These studies are purposely or inadvertently constructed to replicate Spearman, largely in order to preserve an existing socioeconomic and professional hierarchy in society that benefits the already benefited, including those doing the studies. Next slide. They follow boring dictum of intelligence being what the test tests. That is, the tests created by people intent on valuing themselves and others like themselves. So intelligence is defined as privileged Westerners define it. But if you look around the world, and we've done studies on five continents, you find that many societies define intelligence completely differently. For example, in a study we did in rural Kenya, we found four terms for intelligence, Ryoko, Luro, Paro, and Winjo, corresponding roughly 
to what in my own theory of uh, adaptive intelligence I've called analytical, practical, creative intelligence and wisdom. In other words, I would argue that indigenous people often had a broad, have a broader and more accurate conception of intelligence than the Westerners who study intelligence. They see it in a much more adaptive and holistic sense. Next slide. So here's an example from a study we did in rural Kenya. A small child in your family has HOMA. She has a sore throat, headache, and fever. She's been sick for three days. Which of the following five yad naya lua herbal medicines can treat HOMA? And what you would find is that none of our children, no matter what our IQs, almost none could solve any of the problems. The kids in rural Kenya didn't have any trouble with this. Why? Because we're measuring the intelligence that's important for kids in rural Kenya. They grow up in, a, in an environment, in a context where their biggest problem is parasitic infections, malaria, schistosomiasis, trichuriasis, hookworm. And so for them to be adaptive, they need to know this stuff. Next slide, please. When we first submitted this paper, the item was criticized as culturally specific by reviewers, and the practical skills measured is not relevant to contemporary post-Western, post-industrialized Western society. And you know what? They were wrong, because what COVID-19 has shown is that the skills these rural Kenyan kids are so relevant. I mean, like there's so many high IQ people some of them dying because they don't wear masks, they don't socially distance, they don't wash their hands, they make the whole thing into a political statement, regardless of their IQ. So which is intelligent, killing yourself and other people by breathing on them or getting a high score on a, a math section uh, with problems that you'll never see again in your life? Next slide. Uh, here's another one we did in rural Alaska among um, Yupa kids. When Eddie runs to collect a ptarmigan that he shot, just shot, he notices that his front pouch is full of ptarmigan food. This is a sign that. And again, this is about their eating. If you don't hunt or you don't ice fish in those environments, you don't eat. But we insist on using our items that are relevant for our kids giving them to kids for whom the items have little or no relevance, and then concluded, wow, our kids are so much smarter than their kids, even though if our kids took tests of adaptive intelligence that are relevant to those kids' environments, our kids would look not very bright. Next slide, please. And this item also was uh, criticized by reviewers as culturally specific, for us, it's going to a supermarket, but for them, you, you eat what you kill. Oddly, they do not criticize this culturally specific content that's specifically taught in Western schooling, such as reasoning with abstract geometric figures, which was once falsely assumed to be cultural free and universal, but the Flynn effect of rising IQs in the 20th century showed to be the most culturally loaded value uh, uh, items of all. Next slide. The tests that are used are purposely chosen to be narrow and usually G-based, general intelligence-based. When broader tests are used, such as of creative, practical, emotional, and other forms of intelligence, this uh, supposedly natural positive manifold either decreases or vanishes. Next slide. And we've shown this again and again in our studies of college admissions, graduate school admissions, business school admissions, no one wants to hear it because it overturns an existing structure. Next slide. The problem is that the correlations, which are supposed to be the natural order of things, are largely socially constructed and then interpreted as the natural order. Historically, society has somewhat arbitrarily created funnels to allow some people to succeed and other, leave others to fail. And of course, the ones who are uh, set up to succeed are the ones whose parents can afford the good schools and the test preparation and the books and so on. Next slide. So in over time, criteria for rising in the funnel have included socially defined race, ethnicity, religion, sex, 
family socioeconomic status, which it still includes in IQ or SAT or ACT or GRE or whatever, which turns out to be highly correlated with SES. So different societies make up different funnels. They find that people succeed in that funnel and they conclude there's a causal relationship. Next slide. Parents of higher SES can afford to send children to schools that confer a better pedigree, choose higher quality schools that better teach their kids the skills needed for academic success, including more challenging courses and better academic preparation, and they can pay for test preparation books and courses. I remember being in Lucknow, India, and thinking that you know, these kids in some of these slums, it wouldn't matter. And it's true in the United States, it doesn't matter what their IQ is. They're not going anywhere because there's so little mobility for those kids. And it, unfortunately, it's just as true in the United States. Next slide. So they can afford for their children to take college admissions tests more often. They can better acquire for their children various kinds of special ed diagnosis. They can ensure that the school is properly caring for their children. They can provide their children with educational experiences, home life, that prepare them for advancement in the school and society. There's nothing wrong with that. I mean, that's great. I mean, you know, parents should do everything they can for their kids. The problem is not with them. It's the kids who don't have these advantages, as Ed Gordon and I discussed so many years ago, they just are shunted aside. Next slide. If students in the United States or anywhere were admitted to privileges solely because of height, suppose that to get into Harvard, you have to be seven feet tall and yell 6'11 and, you know, podunk, you uh, three feet eight. If we did admissions by height, then tall individuals soon would occupy positions of privilege, as they already do, leading the privilege to conclude that their height is naturally, this is what God wants, what enable them to succeed and what leaves others to fail. That the short people are losers without the realization that these correlations on which the whole field of intelligence has been built are simply created by the funnels we construct in society. Next slide. So in conclusion, the study of intelligence is, and always has been, not so much a science as a scientization of a prevailing ideology with the goal of justifying and perpetuating the success of those in power in a providing enhanced opportunities for their children. It's no different in any other society. Just different societies use different things. They may use test scores to learn their socioeconomic status. They may use religion. They may use socially defined race. They may use height. Uh, many scientists studying intelligence have been right, witting or unwitting collaborators in this rather raw exercise of power by existing privileged classes. They throw fake confetti on themselves and their descendants. Next slide. Surely we can do better. Thank you very much for listening. And Ed, uh, I'm so glad to be here. You know, years ago, you told me that you took zinc to prolong your life, and I didn't listen to you. And now you're 100. So you know what I've done? Uh, one of the many things I've learned for you is I've started taking zinc. And I'm not, I don't hold stock or anything, but it worked for you. I'm hoping it works for me. Thanks a lot. Thank you so much, Dr. Sternberg. May we all uh, take more zinc, have more life, and more opportunities to share our scholarship. Uh, I really appreciate it. You know, what, an, what a powerful exemplar of the need to focus more on human capacity than this, uh, this notion of a fixed attitude that Dr. Gordon so brilliantly has articulated for us consistently over time. Um, right now, I have the honor to introduce uh, my, my colleague and uh, a brilliant um, anthropologist, uh, Professor Herbie Varen to talk about his work and, and, and how it may intersect with the work of Dr. Gordon. Okay. Um, 50 years ago, when Ed Gordon was 50, I entered the world of Teachers College as a very young 25-year-old assistant professor. I now realize that I was then quite ignorant of what Teachers College was all about, but I sound soon found out figures who towered over me and would soon teach me much that had not been taught at the University of Chicago, which had just granted me a PhD. There was a Fritziani, an anthropologist, who signed my letter of appointment. Most importantly, he directed the research project on high schools that became the foundation 
of much of my research career over the next 25 years. There was, of course, Larry Kremen, who had built up the Department of Family and Community Education, which was now mine. As he expanded my understanding of education and made educational research relevant to an anthropologist, he obliged me to focus on the role of families on the educational careers of their children. This focus has remained with me and became the basis of my collaboration with Ed Gordon later in my career. Ed Gordon was, of course, in 1972, already one of the formidable figures at whom I looked from afar at first. I was, as I was made aware again and again of my limitation as a researcher in the organization of American life and the careers of its people. Ed Gordon, I said, was 50 when I joined Teachers College. It took many years before we crossed paths in a meaningful intellectual way. I date this moment to the time when, around 1995, he invited me to write a summary report on families, education, and the state in America. And it took me many years to realize that even 50 years ago, Ed Gordon had directly contributed to what became the foundations of my own subdiscipline of anthropology and education. In, 90, in 1965, seven years before I joined Teachers College, uh, and I'm not going to calculate his age at that point, he had organized one of these interdisciplinary conferences that he kept arranging over the years and for which he is justly famous. As I experienced them 40 years later, that those conference, that conference of the 1965 conference also brought together an interdisciplinary group of psychologists, sociologists, as well as, most importantly for me, anthropologists and linguists. Strikingly, but not surprisingly for those who know Ed Gordon well, the participants were to become the pillars of their respective fields, and particularly of mine, the cultural anthropology of education. The edited volume that brought together some of the papers from that 1965 conference introduced a focus on matters that would define the field and its application in teacher education for the following 20 years at least, and that are still somewhat with us, as is reflected in several of the papers presented in this session. The, the 1965 volume, actually published 1972, is titled Functions of Language in the Classroom. <clears throat> it was published the same year I joined Teachers College, and it established a new way of looking at the unfolding of systematic, and we would now say systemic, problems as a schooling. Then, like now, it was a scandal that schooling, which is altogether a utopian solution to all forms of privilege, whether from birth or condition, was being proven again and again to have been a failure. This was the time of the Coleman Report, uh, which first signaled the importance of family background for success in school. At the, more at the same time, the French sociologists Bourdieu and Passeron were publishing their famous reproduction, which argued that schooling is one of the main means through which social classes were produced uh, in uh, school societies. Uh, the papers in the 1972 volume predates by many years what we now know as critical race theory, but it established much of its theme as they focused on what keeps happening in American classrooms when white teachers meet black students, as well as students from various First Nations. Um, the papers note the mechanisms of misunderstanding, miscommunication based on varied expectation of what is normal. The authors, of course, disagreed on the details of what are the conditions that produce ongoing struggles, though they all agree that the result of the struggles is very often the labeling of the students as failures, uh, people who do not get credit for the times they spend in school and all the work that they did there. Um, 
not surprising, not surprising, yes, if, if it's scholars, and I may be one of them, none of them propose specific steps to reform schooling or the direct context of schooling. They were probably sympathetic to the impetus, impetus to produce Head Start, one of the major achievements of the great society, as Anne-Marie uh, Kausi um, said. Uh, she, she reported, and we knew that, um, that Ed Gordon was one of the architect of a program and that he also himself sometimes deemed it a failure in spite even of much research suggesting that it is not. Uh, I suspect Robert Sternberg might agree that whether Ed Start is a success or a failure depends very much on wh who is measuring what as well as the time frame and full context of the measurements. And it also depends on one's interpretation of what is possible at any moment in time. Head Start, head start like the current movement toward universal pre-K, proceeded from the possible plausible hypothesis, or perhaps it was only a hope, that by having children at various risks start schooling earlier, they would be able better to compete with children at less risk. By the time I joined Ed Gordon in his continuing search for both causes and mechanisms and for plausible solutions, he had been advocating uh, in a, you know, some, somewhat of a shift uh, for what he called comprehensive education that would provide children at risk with the advantages that other children had. Um, by then, it was much less certain that it may have been in the early 1970s that it was enough to reform teacher education by emphasizing what then became multicultural education, bilingual education, and all of these famous reform movements of the 1980s and 90s. Uh, certainly, the research work of the early anthropologists and linguists I mentioned made these programs seem a plausible solution, though by the 1990s they seem less plausible. Uh, what the more recent work at Gordon has encouraged uh, through his conferences and edited volumes was designed to move us away, I think, from these earlier solutions. Um, uh, Kelsey emphasized the role of families as direct participants in the education of their children, something I really find extremely important and needs to be stressed again and again. Uh, Sternberg, in the written paper, not on the slides you heard, but in the paper I read, does the, bed, does the same when he mentions family traditions in various trades. Uh, 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 as, a fam as famous anthropologists like to say, when a child is born, it can be anything anywhere in the world. This, ch this child might learn any language, come to appreciate any musical style, and so on. But when the child now adult dies, only a small number of all these potentialities will have been experienced. This is the fundamental paradox of any attempt to explain any particular achievement by investigating the mental capacities of individuals. And I think uh, the last uh, Sternberg's paper and uh, um, Boykin's paper uh, made that point in very, from very di different angles. Uh, and yet, and this is uh, the very foundation of schooling and its reform is based on the hope that an institution might type, tap directly into those capacities. Even John Dewey, in his famous educational creed, says, as he put it, that he believes that the only true education comes through the stimulation of the child's powers by the demands of the social situations in which he finds himself. And I think we have heard echoes of this in some of the programs we have heard about. Um, uh, as um, and so I, I kind of suspect that we are not really ready to abandon an interest in children's powers. Um, 
And I am not sure either that we are going to stop looking for the means to identify powers uh, and then build on them. Um, uh, I suspect that we are not going to abandon all this since the very title of this session includes a phrase about intellective competence. That sounds very much like what we had in mind more than a century ago, but that may be debatable. And yet I have a sense that some of us in this session, and perhaps particularly Kelsey and Sternberg, and maybe also Boykin, would argue that we should focus less on potential powers, aptitudes, talents, and so on, and more on the challenging social situations in which these powers may flower or not. The problem is that social situations are indeed challenging, uh, and the f we may want to focus more on the challenges than on the powers. But the challenges, and again, I think that Boykin tells us about uh, even something that seems simple as logarithms, <laughs> are actually very difficult to study. Um, certainly are based on my own 50 years of research on family and community matters, I'm very, really not really sanguine about all efforts to build up the families of children at risk with programs aimed at them. Uh, the problem is that any such program uh, is likely to be matched by efforts of families uh, with children apparently not at risk. That is, we are not simply... Uh, um, uh, I've always been struck, and I've written about that in various places, about the amount of work needed to maintain privilege. Uh, uh, going back in some ways to Sternberg's paper, uh, it's not only the case that the children of Silicon Valley engineers, or university professors for that matter, have more powers than the children of those who clean their offices. It is the case that the engineers and the professors make very strong efforts to get their children where they, they themselves are, social reproduction. And of course, a lot of us who have been uh, in these situations know that these efforts fail. <laughs> uh, privilege is hard work. And pessimistically, perhaps, any effort that appears to fight the fruits of privilege is likely to end with even stronger work by those who already enjoyed them. This brings me to the question of agency that was not quite raised very often in the papers, but it uh, included in the title to the session. Every time I hear the word, or when I hear scholars and practitioners mentioning the development of agency, I shudder that we are falling back into the tri trap of individualizing the sources of adult achievement or lack thereof, and thus losing the necessary focus on social processes, and particularly on the details of the processes that may produce the large scale structurings that are easier to see. I insist with my students that agency is equally shared among all human beings. I sometimes say that this is what moved Homo sapiens from East Africa to the moon. The parents of children at risk must be assumed to be doing all that they can given their resources. And I think Ed Gordon has emphasized this again and again, but sometimes it, we have not taken this as much to heart as we should in our own research. How to get, uh, uh, how to get people, the, these resources that they might need, what these resources might be, which one we might have a chance of giving them should remain a problem. Uh, in 1965, Ed Start sounded good. Well, it's not necessarily that bad. Uh, pre universal pre-K sounds very good. Uh, program like those uh, Roboski and Boykin mentioned may help on some matters. I know that Ed Gordon participated in many of those. When we started working together, she, together he was working with the Harlem Children's Zone and at times criticized what they were doing and how it was being scaled. Um, 
uh, including its preschools, after school programs, parent education program, which sounded like what Ed had in mind about comprehensive education. What ha an interesting thing that has happened over the past 20 years in Harlem is, and I think it's a sign of what I would say, the agency of the people there, is that they seem to have taught themselves about that charter schools are a good thing. <laughs> so often to the dismay of public school advocates who really do not think that charter schools are a good thing. And so we have a political back and forth in New York City between those advocates and those who are not advocates. And those are not advocate. What I tell always my students is to emphasize not only that what the school teach parents, but what the parents are teaching themselves about schools. And very, and very often with little help from people like us. It's easy for me to be pessimistic that much will change and I don't want to end there. <laughs> Even if I find it easy uh, to doubt whether the existing or proposed programs will succeed at scale for all sorts of sociological reasons. But we have to remain optimistic as Ed Gordon, I think remained, I mean, it's, that's one of his, one of the things I learned most from him is, is to remain optimistic, even when some of the things that you propose do not seem to be exactly what, you know, prove to do exactly what you thought they were. And, uh, and so, um, I completely agree with him and admire the way he has brought together people from all parts of the research policy and advocacy worlds so they could talk to each other, learn from each other, and move on. So I will end by saying thank you, Ed. Thank you so much, Professor Varan, uh, for, for, your, for your really keen insights and and great sort of like pulling together of a number of themes. I, I really appreciate your focus on agency and the notion of collective agency and how important that is. Um, I now will uh, pass the baton over uh, to Professor Washington, who's been sort of waiting in the wings and uh, we, we've, we've been going through some challenges to get him on here, but he's on here. Um, so I'm really looking forward to hearing uh, your, your comments, sir. Uh, Professor Ernest Washington. Well, thank you very much. and. Thanks, of course, to my good friend, Ed Gordon. We're friends of, oh my God, it must be at least 50 years. And I, I, I don't know anyone else who's had a more profound effect upon my, my life, the lives of my children. He's become personal friends with them and all of this sort of thing. He's such an extraordinary man that, uh, well, you all know that I'm simply sort of preaching to the choir, but, but in any event, it's, you know, I'm so appreciative of him and, and of all the things that he's done over the years, not only you know for me personally, but for the causes that I care about. And for that, I'm everlastingly grateful. But I'd like to, today I'd like to talk about you know, the work I'm doing now. And I have to talk about this relative to, uh, to, uh, to two friends of mine. One is Steve Cerisi and the other is Ted Dacier. And we've been and we've been working together now for the last year or so, and we've been doing something that I, you know, that to me was a kind of a revelation. Now, oh, let me just backtrack one second and say that, you know, one of the great things about that I've enjoyed about it is visiting him, and sort of you know just having great conversations over the years, and and I remember almost. The first time that he explained to me that uh, that assessment could lead education, assessment could lead education. I thought that was like the devil being put in charge of the church or something or other. I couldn't imagine that that was even possible or feasible. But we talked about it, and and like many things over the years, I've I've come to recognize that he's right about those things. And I'm saying this because it's a lead in now to the project that, uh, that Steve, Ted and I are engaged in. And what we're doing is that we're actually looking at a, uh, a data set, the early childhood longitudinal uh, data set 
uh, and this longitudinal data set has is looks at kids, for example, beginning in I think it was 1999, and for the next decade, followed a, about 5,000 of them as they as they proceeded, you know, through the first you know uh, decade of schooling or about that. And it, it's an incredibly interesting study. And of course, you know, this is one of these federally funded studies and there were roughly 1900 variables of one sort or another. Much of it multiple choice tests and this and that sort of thing. And it's a, uh, it's a veritable sort of, you know, gold mine of sort of, of information that hasn't really been mined very much. And so one of the things that we've done is that we kind of set out to kind of, to begin to kind of rethink sort of some of our, suppositions about the nature of education. Now, what are these suppositions? Now, one of them is that uh, we're actually making progress. Now, I don't know about you, but when I look at the cities around me and the ele elementary schools therein, these are the schools where I've been working at for the last 40 years or so. I can hardly discern very much progress in the lives of poor black and brown and, and white children for that matter. And this is, this is a very mm, distressing kind of uh, recognition on my part that for all of that, all of the effort that's been put into it, and many of the teachers there are incredibly well-meaning as well as administrators, they work hard. And at the end of the day, we've made very little progress. Now, how could that be that so many very smart people have worked at something for so long and made so little progress? I, heart, you know, I just sort of, uh, I really resonate to Vereen's comments a few minutes ago about the fact that, you know, that indeed, you know, many of the um, interventions that have been undertaken haven't proved to be successful. And we need to understand that better. Um, I'm not sure precisely what it is, but I think there's some hint of it in the data that we've been looking at as to why you know things have gone the way that they've gone. And so part of what I want to talk to you about is why have we been so seriously mm, unsuccessful in, in thinking about um, the work that, you know, in thinking about the kinds of interventions that we've all been engaged in in one fashion or another at the elementary school level. I, I'm, I know that's a, you know, uh, that's a decision, you know, to sort of look at the elementary school level, but it's the data that we have. And so it's, the, it's what I'd like to sort of talk about for a while. So one of the things that Ed has helped me do is to sort of begin to kind of rethink now what is what is the nature of the knowledge that we're talking about in other words we're worried we worry deeply about the fact that our kids at the end of the day for example haven't learned very much about math and science and you know social studies and reading and math and these sorts of things what could possibly possibly be the reasons for that well what I've begun to, what I began to suspect, uh, and it's not original with me, is that one of the things that we haven't fully grasped, I think, is that each one of these things, for example, the reading and the math, the science, you know, are all languages. And I've, and I take the, and not only that, but there are others there, you know, for example, I think that music is a language. I think that dance is a language. I think that these are all languages. And in one fashion or another, they're parasitic upon sort of the fact that, you know, somewhere about 100,000 years ago, this phenomenal change occurred, the evolution of language. I think it was perhaps, I don't know if it's the greatest change in the history of Homo sapiens, but it was certainly there along with an opposable thumb and maybe standing upright and running and all of these sort of things. But it certainly transformed human beings. And now language, in in my view, and uh, 
these are ideas that I've prolonged or stolen from people uh, like my friend, um, uh, Professor Roper here in the linguistics department and uh, Noam Chomsky and Wittgenstein and others about the centrality of language and how language permeates the structure of our very thought. And in, and in fact, it, in, a, in their views and in mine now, the primary function of language is thinking. And there is much discussion about the function of language, primary function of language is communication. But I think that's rather, that rather mm, is secondary to the fact that it's very instrumental in kind of thinking. And so now, what is the structure of this language that I'm kind of talking about? Well, I want to begin with, uh, with uh, a conversation and some reading I've done of a, of a colleague of ours, uh, uh, Lloyd. And Lloyd, uh, I'm not saying done, but that's not right. Uh, but at any rate, Lloyd has come up with the idea about one of the fundamental things about language is the issue of automaticity. That is, what are those kind of fundamental units of a language? And for example, obviously, for example, in in spoken language, there are words. In uh, in arithmetic, there you know that turns out to be um, you know numbers. In music, it turns out to be notes. You know that sort of thing. But one of the, the very first stage in almost every language are these things. These kind of these kinds of um, behaviors that we have to learn to the level of automaticity. The second stage of development uh, is syntax. And syntax is, of course, the ability to sort of put these uh, basic units into different meaningful combinations. Thirdly, there's generativity. And generativity is simply the ability now to be able to, to further combine these things such, such that a, a small finite group of, uh, of of elements can actually produce an infinite number of possibilities. And fourthly, there's recursion, where one kind of uh, where one kind of uh, one kind of structure, whether it's a word or a phrase or whatever, has the capacity to, to, to fold into another. The next is uh, is semantics. The fact that you know you can you know that is that Meaning making is fundamental to kind of the human enterprise. And the sixth one is actually uh, creativity. Now creativity is, um, is, a, is a very important uh, stage of development in any language. And, and, I, and I, uh, I resonated to it so much because one of the things that I, I think is that so often, we, I failed and we failed to recognize the creativity in our children. And it's, I find that I, I wanted to have a way of thinking about our kids that gave uh, creativity a place. So when we think about kids learning whatever it is they're learning, that they, in fact, they learn it to a level of creativity. And so this is the way that I began to, I'm beginning to think about now the nature of development. And so there are more, again now, there, there, there are more than one kind of language, one other than spoken language. You know, there are the languages of mathematics, the languages of science, the languages of sociology, of psychology, of that. You can, any of the disciplines would have you, for example, learn the fundamentals, learn the relationships, you know, learn the way of generating new possibilities, learn how one thought folds into another. You know, this is kind of synonymous with kind of understanding, you know, development. And I, I resonate to that kind of thing. And I especially prize the notion that uh, all children are capable, capable of creativity. We simply have to allow for it in our thinking for them, you know, that kind of thinking. Okay, so now I'm uh, laying this out to you because 
we're going to be using you know this kind of structure to begin to think about now what's the, is there any evidence for this in this data set now that Steve and Ted and I are are looking at and and how might it how might it you know how might we find evidence of it well it turns out now that um, interestingly and inter interestingly enough this data set that we have has a number of different ways of looking of looking at reading and arithmetic or reading and beginning math, for example. I'll, I'll go over the list here because I don't want to miss them. One is one, one of the one of the most basic units, for example, in reading are things like sight words, beginning sounds, end sounds, uh, letter recognition, words in context, literal inferences. Now those are the uh, those are kind of the uh, you know the examples of automaticity, for example, in reading. Examples of automaticity, for example, in in arithmetic are things like counting numbers, shapes, ordinality. Um, uh, oh. It's just, I'm having trouble reading my writing. Oh, addition and subtraction, multipl multiplication and division. Well, let me try them one more time so that they kind of, you kind of get a, a feel for it. Okay, so these things are things like sight words, beginning sounds, uh, end sounds, uh, letter recognition, words in context, uh, literal inferences for reading, Counting symbols, shapes, ordinality, uh, addition, subtraction, multiplication, and division. Okay, so these are the, these are the um, the basic variables that we began when we began starting looking at, you know, development, academic development in kindergarten. And so our first task now that we've set for ourselves is to kind of look at sort of what is the how well do these variables in kindergarten, for example, predict for, predict uh, achievement in third grade? Third grade, is, as you know, is of some interest because that's when we kind of began to get the kind of hmm, stagnation and some in cases downward spiral of achievement in our children. And so that's why that's of interest to us, you know? So, we did. Uh, we began to look, sort of look at these things in four different groups: uh, blacks, whites, whites, Hispanics, who are self-identified, and those who didn't identify themselves as uh, as uh, as Hispanics. And so they're basically they're basically kind of funda they're basically four groups fundamentally, you know, that sort of thing. And so we began. So we. So we, 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 I'm sorry, that's a kind of a, that's a generous statement. Uh, Steve and Ted began to kind of do sort of various, various analyses of the data, ranging from multiple regression, looking at these things, how well do they predict, do they predict going, predict from kindergarten to uh, third grade, and, um, and multidimensional scaling to kind of give us a picture, sort of, of what are the relations between uh, between these variables when you look at them. Now, one of the things that uh, has been interesting to me is that these data have surprises in them. And, well, I guess that's not a surprise to most of you that data have surprises in them. But at any rate, there were big surprises in it for me. Um, and the first one that kind of the first one that sort of jumped out at me was the uh, was the finding that sight words were not related to anything. That is the idea, you know. For example, that sight words, you know, the number, you know, the number of words that you can kind of that a kindergartner or, or a first grader or whatever would know about uh, would know on the way to reading, right? Um, I've always thought had a you know had a uh, not only a primary place but a necessary place in kind of learning how to read. 
Well, it turns out it's not connected to, it's not a, connected to reading achievement in third grade. And, and the reason that's of some interest to me, of course, is that I, I've always had a, an interest in philosophy and kind of how that intersects with psychology. And one, and you've all, of course, heard about uh, Roger Brown's words, Roger, Roger Brown's uh, famous book, Words and Things, you know, that sort of thing. And, and the equally famous book with it, Word and Objects by Quine, I believe, you know, you know, that sort of thing. So these, the interest in words and how the, you know, and their primacy, especially sight words, you know, just seemed a natural fit. And yet it looks like it might be misleading in some kind of fashion. So what are we, how, how what is going on here? You know, that kind of uh, thought began to kind of jump out at us, you know? Well, one of the first things that we did, one of the first things that Steve and Ted did is that they looked, they did a multi, multi, uh, multi-dimensional analysis of the, uh, of the data. Um, that's not quite right, but it's approximately right. What they, but what they did is that multidimensional scaling is what it is. And they looked at these, at, at these data. And one of the things that, as you might guess, that pop, one of the things that pops out is when you put it all together is that you actually do get, you know, a picture of, um, you know, that, that shows, for example, you know, the, you know, that there really are two factors on one dimension, namely reading and uh, math. But what you don't, but what is surprising to me is that, is that they were absolutely in, that the two, um, two sets of variables were actually in parallel to each other. And not only were, were they in parallel to each other, they were very highly, you know, the variables were very highly intercorrelated, one. And two, they proceeded in the ways that, you know, that you would expect if they were languages. That is that, you know, for example, when you looked at reading, for example, you know, uh, it would turn out, for example, that beginning, you know, when you looked at beginning reading, you'd, you'd find, for example, things like, you know, beginning sounds, ending sounds, you, uh, the interpretation of reading, you know, let words in context. And they were like, you know, beautifully sort of arrayed, you know, in almost a straight line and parallel to it. There's another line that it has mathematic or arithmetic in it that we had just about the same set of uh, correlates, you know, that sort of thing. But that wasn't even the most surprising thing. The most surprising thing is that when you began looking, for example, at black students, you discovered, for example, that reading, that the the very the, ver the variables that pre no no First, for uh, for reading, for example, the mathematics, the uh, addition and subtraction were the most powerful variables in in describing, in predicting learning to read. That was that was kind of surprising. You would expect some of the reading variables to be to have that role, but no, they really didn't, and. Correspondingly, for example, when you began looking, looking at mathematics, for example, some of the reading variables then were the most highly predictive of success. Now, one of the one of the questions we had is that when we looked at the data, for example, on Hispanics, those who were self-identified and those who were not, the most interesting things is that the the, the um, the evidence of what we call automaticity, those things that, you know, the, you know, the variables in both math and reading were both uh, highly predictive and for the same, in about the same proportions for both groups. And so there, was, there wasn't very much difference between these two groups now, between uh, Hispanics who were identified versus self-identified. And so that gave us kind of an interesting kind of start on kind of began to kind of rethink these things. But as you can see now, one of the things that is, that's happened to us is that, well, it, it, we're encouraged to begin, to begin to think about now our next step in, in, in terms of looking at these data. 
because we have data not only about, for example, reading and arithmetic, we have data about the beginnings, the beginnings of uh, understanding social studies and science. And we we're wondering too now, does social science, does, does social studies and and science now give evidence of having the same kind of sort of structures, of linguistic structures that we found present in reading and uh, arithmetic. We're, we're quite confident that we'll find such a thing, but as you well know, there's many a slip between cup and lip. And so we'll be looking forward to kind of the analyses of these data in the months to come and all of that. And hopefully we'll, we'll be together on Ed's 110th birthday to kind of talk about them. And thank you very much for your attention. And thank you so much, uh, Professor Washington, for that really fascinating uh, take on, on, for me as a STEM educator, the notion of, of science and mathematics as languages shifts my thinking, thinking tremendously. So thank you so much for that. And here we are now at the conclusion of what was a riveting and engaging set of presentations that not only drew deep connections to Professor, Professor Gordon's work, but also show these amazing sort of branches on this tree of knowledge. And so we have time for, for two questions. So I'd, I'd like to first invite everybody back on stage, um, all, all of, of our participants, and, um, and then open up the space for those who have joined us today to um, pose questions to our participants. Um, one is coming in from Bridget Anderson. Um, and it, the question is, what role, if any, do you think alumni of colleges and universities can play in creating stronger pathways for underrepresented young people in STEM? And although we never explicitly said STEM in this conversation, I think STEM is a thing that brings all of our works together. So what, what role do you think alumni play in helping to create or fortify these pathways for underrepresented young people in STEM? Sure. Uh, let me just go ahead, Anna Maria. Go ahead, Anna Maria. No. Okay. The, uh, all right. The, Okay, thank you. Um, if, if you look at our Mahoff alumni website, you'll see that we have been studying these students since they were 17 and some are now close to 50. And these are looking at, and this is a matter of alumni continuing to be involved with the program uh, and alumni who in grad and professional schools pulling other students into that work and serving as not only as mentors, but as champions for them. In fact, some of the alumni are now faculty who are putting students in. And so for us, the idea is to have a longitudinal approach to making sure that the alumni continue to be connected to the work and to the students and serve as mentors and champions. It's worked so well though, that it's not just for the MIO program. We're doing that same kind of thing with alumni in general. Yeah, I, I totally agree with what, uh... President Hrabowski say, I would just add that uh, we've got programs both for underrepresented minorities and for women, um, a lot following on the work that he's done. I would add to that, that our alumni who are out there in business settings or in other settings, creating internships for students and helping them because, you know, many of our students, you know, one of the things that we find that's more often the case with, you know, um, you know, underrepresented students is that they really want to know that they're that their work can make a difference in the world and have it be grounded um, to the real world. And that's something that alumni can often do because they're out there in business settings, et cetera, et cetera. Oh, Chris, you're muted. Thank you so much for those responses. And did anybody else want to contribute to, to that question? responses to the role that alumni play in sort of fortifying these pathways. You know, I would say really quickly then, you know, another part is for alumni to, to, um, to actively pursue relationships with their alma mater, right. um, even if those relationships are not necessarily productive. So, you know, oftentimes when you leave, you're like, I'm out of here. And then the university is trying to find you. And it's oftentimes only for the donors. But I think folks who graduate, whether or not you've got positive or negative experience is essential for us to be the ones to extend their hand to forge those relationships back to the institutions. Um, and, and that's something I've learned in my work, although I'm not a member of this esteemed panel. I just wanted to share that. Um, Chris, just one other point. We, in earlier years, because we had not had the success with minority students, 
we did bring back a number of African Americans to hear about their experiences. That can be painful in some ways, but it really does open the eyes of everyone to understand what people thought about the experience they had. Yeah, I, I love that. I love that. I, I, if there are no thoughts on that question, we do have some time for maybe one or two more. So um, the, the, the second question um, is, you know, Dr. Harbaski, to you directly, you know, are, are the four-year colleges and universities looking into how to work with community colleges to increase the number of PhDs? Yes, they are. We've had a number of grants that focus on moving from Gates and other places, focused on moving students from community colleges into these programs. Um, the NIH Build program allows you to bring in students, for example. And so, no, there are structured programs that focus in the STEM on the STEM pathway from two to four year institutions, very much so. And if you look at the work that um, Aspen's been doing, I had a chance to co-chair the Aspen Prize this year, and a number of those community colleges are very successful in moving students into the four year experience with some of them going on for PhDs. Yeah, and Dr. Kossi, yeah. I know it's the University of Washington uh, emphasizes on this as well. So I, I know you have a response here. Yeah, no, I, I, you know, I mean, absolutely. I think universities uh, like Hrabowski's and ours have been doing work with community college students for a long time. About a third of our students are community college students, and they actually graduate at a slightly higher rate than students who come in at first year, although a slightly lower rate in the STEM fields. But, you know, I think that that's been discovered. Uh, Princeton this year for the first time started taking transfer students from community colleges. Now, it was like 17 or 18, so, you know, certainly not the scale. But I think that we're beginning to see universities across the country realizing that um, there's a gold mine in terms of talent at community and technical colleges. I'd love to bend that question a little bit towards uh, Dr. Sternberg. I, I think one of the major themes that you discussed earlier was um, the, the ways that certain folks who have access to test prep and have access to resources are able to sort of like fortify connections between their young people and institutions. Do you have any thoughts on the ways that community colleges may be able to sort of address the fact that there is a gap between the community colleges and, and high, higher education, given that the variable oftentimes is access to resources, prep, uh, um, you know, intermediary courses between community colleges and, 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 and other higher ed institutions. What are your thoughts on that relationship? Well, it's been a number of years since I was in administration, uh, but when I was in administration, uh, we found, at least at Oklahoma State, that there was a very, very smooth transition between community colleges throughout the state and uh, Oklahoma State. I, I would add one thing, and that is I think the mistake many science teachers make is uh, overemphasis on content which students soon will forget. Um, uh, you know, when I took introduct, I'm, I'm a psychologist of sorts, or at least I uh, pretend to be. Uh, when I took I introductory psychology, I got a C, uh, and Phil Zimbardo was told me he got a C, and Steve Cece told me he got a C. Uh, and at least in my case, that was extremely discouraging. And uh, fortunately, I decided instead to major in math and did worse than that, so I went back to uh, psychology. But I think what happens is that often the assessments, whether it's a community college or four years, are very much oriented toward kids who are good memorizers, who, you know, take the book, memorize it, will give you a multiple choice test. And I understand that. My most recent course had uh, 300 kids. But the result is you end up with the promoting the wrong people into STEM fields uh, and making that transition. And so what we need to emphasize is teaching kids how to think scientifically and assessing for how to teach science, how to think scientifically rather than promoting kids in who are really good memorizers. And those of us who went to graduate school all remember those first year students that were so good at getting A's and they had the really high GREs and they never have an idea. And, yeah, and that's just the wrong way to do it. I have to tell you a Bob Sternberg story. When I took my first statistics class at Yale, I had a professor, it was his last quarter there, thank God. Um, he came out of animal learning. All his, ex all his examples were about, you know, and it was all about memorizing fact. I was, the one thing that made me really lucky is that he was so disengaged that he didn't turn in his grades. 
because if I had, I would have been on probation. My second stats class was with Bob. What Bob had us do was analyze our own data set in different ways. I was so excited. Not only did I get an honors, which is an A in this class, but that paper ended up basically with some, with some more work being published. Um, and that's the difference. That really is the real difference. When I saw if, if learning these techniques was going to help me understand something I cared about, I was going to work to master it when it just was about memorizing and tied to nothing. So, Bob, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Do you want to come here? Dr. Bosky, please, please, please pop right, right. Just you know, one other point. We were talking about producing PhDs, and I know I talked in the paper about a lot of that. I didn't hear. The, uh, but the, let me just say this, that we need to think about, and we saw this in this National Academy's report, producing people of color at different levels in science. The PhD level is important. We want to produce more for the professoriate and more in research labs, but we need people of color at all the levels. And the person who called in before was from Montgomery College. We just happened to have a biotech program with them two years there and then over to our Shady Grove campus, the outside of DC. But there are so many jobs at the two-year level, four-year level, master's level in biotechnology as one example. And I, I think it's the genius of the end versus the tyranny of the or. It's not just producing PhDs. It's producing students for all these jobs that are available in different science and technology areas and the need for four and two-year institutions to work collaboratively. I, I, absolutely. I, 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 though my only sort of like chagrin at this moment is that we didn't have more time to ask questions and engage in this type of dialogue. I think uh, you know folks would, would really benefit from that. But I'd like to thank you all so much for your brilliant insight, um, for your connections to Dr. Gordon's work. Um, I've learned so much, and I think Malcolm's had enough <laughs> of our presentation. But, but but thank you all so much again. And and please, for everyone who's who's watching this, um, please join us for the rest of this amazing conference. The other sessions promise to be as engaging and as powerful. Um, thank you all again for your time, and I'll, I'll catch you all at some point later. <laughs> bye bye. Thank you. Kudos to Ed Gordon. Yes. Go. The great, the great professor. <laughs>